Hey, first of all, welcome to everybody. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you guys are uh, are, are tuning in from. And uh, uh, just want to say hello uh, to everybody out there. Uh, and uh, really appreciate the opportunity to sit with with Coach Corin and and connect with you guys. And and uh, as we've all become incredibly comfortable here with with Zoom and every other, you know, Google Hangout, every other way to connect. Uh, Virtually, uh, we thought it'd be a great opportunity to just catch up in front of you guys and, and chat a little bit about what what's going on right now. And I think uh, I guess I want to start really by saying and make it really clear to you guys that we're here to talk water polo. We're here to um, you know get, go over some of the things that are happening right now and coaching and share um, you know a lot of coaches' knowledge and experience in this in this area. But at the same time, we hope that everybody out there is safe and healthy and um, taking care of themselves and taking care of their families and, and, and navigating this, you know, worldwide, uh, pandemic to the best of their abilities. And, and we really wish you guys all the best because, uh, what water polo is in the grand scheme of all of this is, is just a small part, right? So, um, what we're going through here in water polo and the fact that we all miss water polo and the fact that we all miss being together on pool decks, it's really just a microcosm of what's, what's happening in the big picture. So hope that your families are well and that we're all doing our best to, uh, stay home together, right? So while we're at home together, we can, we can try to connect. And so I uh, want to send you guys your well wishes and, and, and hope that we can uh, uh, spend some time together here too. So coach, I know uh, uh, you may share some of those sentiments, but uh, how are you guys doing over there? And how, how are you holding up? Um, yeah, we're holding up. I mean, uh, like you, I think, uh, I think as I've stated before, it's just, I, I think this, during this call, I mean, obviously we're going to be talking water polo, but it, it does quite frankly seem a little awkward even to talk water polo, even with my team at, at times because uh, of all the people that are are either suffering or um, that are on the front lines, all the healthcare professionals. I mean, big shout out to to all of them. I mean, that are working their tails off in order to keep people healthy and uh, doing the best that they can with with what they have. I mean, this is a this is a tough time, and um, yeah, we'll 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 get through it. Um, and I think it's just important for the rest of us. I guess if I have a message before we we move forward, it's just like you know everyone's got a role, and it's time uh, people need to play their role, whether you're on the front lines or whether you're one of the ones that's sick and needs to be quarantined or if you just need to keep your butt at home, then keep your butt at home. Um, we got to execute our role to the best of our ability for something much larger than, than ourselves. And uh, hopefully we can all do that. The sooner that we can all commit to that, the, obviously the sooner that this country is going to be able to, to heal and, and move on. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. We all, we all got to play our part. And I think, uh, you know, specifically for, for us here in the water polo world, I think everyone's anxious to get back in the pool and, and we, don't, we don't know when that's going to be, right? We, we don't have a, a clear answer of when, when it's going to happen and, and I know questions are coming in about summer events and all these big things that, that can or can't be happening. And I think, uh, I think our message for everyone is, is hang on tight and kind of follow. Let's do what yeah. Coach says, play a role and let's keep going. And when, when yeah. we're allowed to, we are. Believe me, no one's more anxious to... Uh, get us back in the pool than, than the people you're talking to today, right? I mean, where this is uh, our livelihood, is our passion. I mean, we do these, we've done talks like this uh, in person with you guys a lot. And always the message when we're, when we're with each other is, you know, we hope that you play water polo for the rest of your life and you're as passionate about it as, as we all are that have decided to make it this, this huge part of our lives. So um, that time will come. We just got to be patient. And I think it's uh, um, important that we stay patient and, and keep doing that. But one of those big things that, that was pushed out um, coach was was obviously the Olympics and so with uh, I think that was probably the the shoe that dropped in the water polo world for us here that started everybody thinking about all the other water polo events and you know what's happening here because that's the uh, the, the granddaddy of them all right the, the the big the big show and we were only a few months away from that and so um, I know you've spoken about it already but just kind of thoughts on the on the postponement and and, and how it's been yeah. postponed, how you and the, the team have been going through that well, it, it's been, it's, it's been kind of a progression. You know, we, we, I remember we were, um, I think when we first started kind of hearing a little bit about it, we were in Holland, uh, at the time in, in February, uh, and we were spent a week in Holland and then a week in Colorado Springs. And, 
you kind of heard about it over in China, um, some cases in, in Japan, and, you know, we got word back that, you know, possibly the test event, which we were planning on going to, to Tokyo for the test event to compete in the Olympic pool um, in the beginning of April, and we're kind of hearing, uh, they may, may cancel it. We, you know, I don't think anyone took it that seriously, honestly, at, at, at that point. Uh, and then we returned from Colorado Springs, you know, that got canceled. Uh, and this, you know, just started to snowball, right? We had a, a series with Australia that was canceled in April. We had bummed or we're not going out to the Midwest. You know, we had that right. great tournament planned in, in Indy, which I think would have been awesome for all the fans and players, coaches out there that got canceled. And then, you know, it was almost inevitable uh, right. that the Olympics were going to get canceled. I think we all had a, a really good sense of, of that. I think the biggest thing for us is just we're incredibly grateful and thankful. You know, an Olympic Games, as most people know, has never been postponed. I mean, this right. is right. uncharted territory. So uh, where I think three or four have been canceled due to world right. wars and, and such. So for them to for the IOC and the organizing committee to work through all the details. And I can't, people just think, okay, it's not a big deal. Just move it back one year. Right, there are right. so many details that go into moving the world's biggest event by a year. Uh, it's not that easy. And their commitment to keeping this, keeping the games intact, uh, we couldn't be more thankful and, and grateful to uh, the people of Japan and, and the IOC for, for doing this. Yeah, it's fun. For sure, we're grateful for it because it, the decision could have easily been to cancel, right? That that would have, uh, that was the easy decision. And they made the, frankly, the incredibly tough decision, like you're saying. I mean, that's not easy. And I mean, for everybody out there who's, who's watching or listening, imagine when you plan a 12 team tournament, you know, local tournament in the weekend and you have to cancel and or so you postpone that and reschedule it how much effort that that takes, you know, then multiply that times a billion, right? And multiply that times a village, an Olympic village that is was being constructed, still under construction at the time and was built for long-term housing for residents of Tokyo after the games were over. Um, so there's a lot of those little things. I mean, and those are all still being uh, played out, right? But the the magnitude of that, the moving that event is, is, is no small task for sure. And so um, we're cer certainly grateful for that. And, uh, uh, and glad that you guys still, everybody gets a chance to compete around the world. And, and, and I think one of the questions that's come up is why, why a year? Why the fall? Why, why not the fall? Why not the spring? Why the summer? And a lot of sometimes I think what we hear on our side is about like a level, like leveling the playing field or kind of making it fair for everybody. Can you speak to how it, now the fact that it's next year um, and now and, and putting it out that far you know, helps level the playing field? Well, I, I mean, I, I can't speak for the IOC necessarily, but I would imagine um, as they've, they've come out and stated that one, I mean, the, the biggest thing is like, we don't have no idea what, what the fall is going to look like. Um, we, they need to give, we need to give ourselves as much time as possible uh, to make sure that we're putting things in place to help, you know, take care of this pandemic. And obviously by pushing it out a year, uh, gives us a little bit more breathing room there, hopefully for a vaccine, um, more things in place, drugs and things that they can develop to, uh, to help uh, fight that. And I think from a level playing field standpoint, I mean, it seems like the whole world is going through this right now, you know, so uh, everyone's going through the same thing. And then, and quite frankly, you know, there's different stages, right? We we may be on the early stage of of it, whereas some of these other countries might have to suffer a little bit later here in, in the year as, sure. as they turn into winter time, especially right. the, the Southern hemisphere. Uh, but I, I think in general, I mean, it just, you got to think about how much time and effort goes into training uh, to be at your very best. And, you know, I, I know we're out for another month, which will make it a month and a half without training. Uh, I, you know, no, no, this is just my speculations. <laughs> Don't right. take it for what it's worth, but yeah. I think this is going into, going through May as well. So it, just even if you take that, it's like two and a half months of being right. out of the water. I mean, right. the longest that they're ever out of the water is two weeks. And right. after that, they're a shell of their former selves. So right. imagine two and a half months and 
the road uh, will be a, a very long one in order to get back to kind of where everyone's capable and we'll certainly need that that time yeah it makes that makes some sense and uh and I think that was a big concern. Another big concern that's been coming up, and and uh, I thought it'd be actually fun for you to walk us walk us through this um, would be uh, one thing. One concern that came out immediately, I know across the board, is like people who had already qualified for the Olympics, right? Like, would would the IOC honor you know people's qualifications? And this happens a lot, like in individual sports. Obviously, in our team sport, you know things may change, but we're we're still a group. Um, but you guys, uh, uh, us uh, USA Warpo women and men, had qualified for the Olympics already, so. Just to clarify for everybody, we've, you know, that qualification stands. Um, but <laughs> I, I hope think, so. Yeah, I think <laughs> not gonna wood. But uh, I don't. I think that's a little bit of a confusing thing for some people out there. How do you qualify for the games? What is it? Yeah. You know, what what is that process and what it's like? And uh, uh, I, we had a we had a. I'll share a quick image and maybe you could walk us through the uh, um, what the qualifications like. I tried to get Shieldy on here for a uh, uh, an interview to explain this for us, but he was uh, previously occupied. Uh, he's a popular man at this time, but if I uh, uh, if I were to share share this image, Shieldy walked us through this. I think a while ago, right, on how to how to qualify for the Olympics, mm -hmm. you know, uh, along the way. This was this was the path, you know, that uh, that most teams took. And for the first time in the history of women's water polo, um, yeah. there was a qualification outside of the con normal pathway of continental qualifiers, right, which is for us, Pan American Games or European Championships and, yeah. and things like that. So maybe let's maybe let's go, you know, ten months or so back to like how did your team qualify for the Olympics? How did how did our women qualify for the Olympics? And um, you know, and what other paths did they have to get there? Yeah, well, we are you know our very first chance to qualify was uh, a World League Super Final in June of uh, two thousand nineteen. And that was, like you said, that was the first time that that's ever been an opportunity. So there's the winner of that. And then uh, it was going to be the top or the winner of, of rural championships in, in uh, South Korea in July. And, and you know, uh, the tournament in Budapest, the World League Super Final, uh, obviously we, we had success there. We won the tournament, which allowed us, allowed us to qualify. And, and that was... Uh, it was nice just to be able to kind of get that out of the way, but it presented some challenges um, as well, just to admit, you know, usually we have a little bit more time to kind of spend together in order to prepare for a large right. event. Uh, and really that was our number one goal this summer. Obviously winning world championships was, was incredible, but we wanted to qualify no, number one. And uh, we usually, we get everyone back together training in, at the end of May, you know, when college season is done, when the players that were we had more players playing overseas this past year than we've ever had before in the history mm -hmm. of the program and so to receive everyone back got together at the end of may and it was literally i think a, a week maybe or two yeah. two weeks most of training together and then competing in that tournament and the funny thing I, you just that i remember from that tournament is just like everyone was in, was a nervous wreck uh and you know typically this team doesn't hey I think everyone gets anxious and a little bit of nervousness happens but uh, I think that nervousness came from the lack of preparation you know uh, yeah. you know pressure is something that is that you feel a little bit stronger when you're not prepared and we weren't prepared to be quite frank it was tough mm -hmm. to prepare for the, for that event but we're able to not necessarily play our best and still come out with a victory which which uh, gave us gave us the birth and uh, obviously accomplished our number one goal. Yeah. So that's kind of where this like path began, right? Like, like 10 months ago, right? You get a chance to, to women's, first of all, women's NCAA season finishes, right? So that's like early May. So the two yeah. week period you're talking about is like, you know, two weeks after NCAAs and then immediately get on a plane, uh, tr get together, train a little bit, you know, uh, as much as you can, get on the plane, go to Budapest and play in this World League Super Final. Um, which then for the, again had that had that qualification. But how are how are other teams qualifying? What does the field look like? You know, um, for the rest of the teams, and there because there's some field that's still open, right? There's still some spots to be filled. You know, TBD, correct? Yeah. Um, obviously, Australia qualifies uh, mm -hmm. because uh, I don't even think New Zealand really challenges that that spot, the Oceania mm -hmm. spot. Mm -hmm. um, 
world world championships you know the winner of world championships uh got a bid obviously we'd already qualified so since we won it was just the next next team which was spain uh our continent still gets uh, a bid so i think you know our biggest fans were probably canada um you know they wanted us to to qualify at world league super final or world champs so right, right. when we got to pan american games it it gave them a much better chance of, of qualifying for the Olympics and, and they're qualified that, you know, the, the crazy thing is that the, the Asian continent, uh, they have right. their Asian games and that was, you know, at very, at first was supposed to be, I think in March and it got canceled because of this pandemic, it was going right. to be in Kazakhstan and right. they came out and basically said, you know, FINA came out and basically said, well, we can't have it they chose basically the Olympic qualifier based on results two years ago, which was somewhat right. controversial, right? No one wants right. to necessarily qualify based on right. results two years ago. Yeah. yeah um, yeah. And now I think thankfully in some ways is like now the qualification process can go through its usual process. Um, right. And I, I forgot about the, the European, uh, yeah. European, the European championship as well. Um, yeah. And Russia was a team that, that qualified uh, out of there. Spain was already qualified. And so there's one, really one event left, and that's the right. qualification tournament. It was supposed to be at the end of May of, of this year, and now they're going to have to push that back. And they're still looking for uh, three teams, I think, um, possibly two, depending on whether South Africa uh, joins, joins in the mix. And uh, if they do, then it's only two teams, two European teams out of uh, out of a bunch, but probably four that are that are really really good: Greece, Holland, yeah. Hungary, and uh, who am I forgetting? Oh, Italy. 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 So four four teams. You know, there's a chance that two of those teams, uh, unfortunately, won't get the opportunity to play in the Olympic Games. Yeah, and this is and this is we're talking about a field that's now ten teams, right? Because in the past the Olympic Games women's on this on the women's side has only been eight, so the field yeah. is expanded to ten. But the reality is, some of these teams you mentioned have uh, won world championships and then not competed in the Olympics the year after, or or uh, 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 in that scenario, right? We're talking about Greece and Holland and these teams, teams that you've seen, uh, everybody has seen us here host uh, for great competition and still may not get a chance to play in the game, so. Any 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 chance we know when that uh that qualification tournament must be pushed back now till next year, right? Probably. Hmm. Yeah, I would imagine um, the timeline they're probably thinking is March or April. Um, that's when it typically is. It's March or April of of twenty twenty one, and I would, the plan was to have it in Trieste, Italy. So uh, I would imagine that that would still still be the plan. Yeah. So as people keep keep trickling in and you guys out there, um, welcome everybody. And if you, uh, um, as we go through this, we'll just keep chatting. And, and, and at the end, if you guys have some questions, feel free to use, there's a Q and A function um, on Zoom. You can, you can uh, pop some questions in there. And as we uh, get closer to the end of the conversation, we'll happen to answer some questions and, 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 and engage with you guys that way. Um, if you're looking for that, it's usually at the bottom of your screen, right, right under, uh, if you may need to move your mouse around a little bit, but it should pop up, so. Um, Let's go back, coach, that 10 months, right? So we're in Budapest. Yeah. Uh, it's challenging. We got to get through. You got to coach through not preparing. And then you get into the final game. That final game has been uh, pushed around a little bit this week on some uh, different social media channels. You played Italy in yeah. the final, right? And so what was, what was yeah. that game like you know, for you guys as a team? As you're just, that's now an Olympic qualification gold medal game uh, at that time. Yeah, you know, it was uh it was chaotic. I mean, we we didn't we didn't play very well. Uh and um it was close. I mean, it's probably the closest game we've had in a in a long time besides our um our somewhat recent series with with Australia. I mean, it it had been probably the closest game that we had had in the 3 years prior in in this quad. So to to be in that situation uh and not necessarily be familiar with that that situation I think what was difficult uh at the end of the day we we won with our determination kind of it, it wasn't pretty but we won uh with our with our heart and, and I think the one thing people forget and for those coaches out there is like you know for at least for me um 
this is the one thing I little I miss about about coaching in college is that uh, especially in these off years, I, I there's literally long phases of of the year in which I'm not coaching any right. games, and so uh, I said to the team afterward, I, I mean, I, I typically believe most of the coaching happens before the game, right? Um, the, the coach can only kind of screw it up, I, I feel like, and I almost screwed it up in that game. I mean, I I was just out of sorts, uh, just my with my organization of when the substitute substitution patterns, the just getting a feel for the game timeouts. Uh, I was making, I was flustered and it was a really good reminder for me that, that these games aren't just important for our athletes. They're important for, for me as a coach to be able to kind of keep my skills honed. And um, obviously we put a plan together from that point forward to kind of help us with that or help me with that. But it was a chaotic game that, I'm just fortunate we we got through it. Yeah, I'll throw another challenge if we're talking about coaching through adversity, right? You got to get your reps in. The, the athletes got to get their reps in. You've only been together for less than two weeks. You're trying to qualify for the Olympics in this tournament, and new FINA rules came into play as yeah. well. Uh, and you're trying to adapt to these rules in the middle of it. I could tell um, you're a little hard on yourself, but I'll I'll, get, I'll, I'll let you have some self-deprecation in this. But <laughs> but I could tell it was a little tough. I was there with you guys in yeah. Budapest and in that game. It was it was a tense game. And as we were watching it, I could tell this was a challenging moment because um, the, those of you guys know with some of the new rules in the FINA allow for flying substitutions on the side. Yeah, yeah. And I'll, and I'll never forget this moment. I've told, I've told you this before, but we're in the game. I could see you um, screaming at some athletes that to line up on the side to do the hockey or flying substitutions to come in. Yeah. You're not the ones to come out and no one could hear each other and no one could figure it out. And this is a yeah. cluster of trying to substitute. Yeah. And it's a one goal game in the fourth quarter with the Olympic uh, qualification on the line. So it was, it was a pretty gnarly, you know, scene, I think at that point. Yeah. Yeah. They can't hear me. And then the, the, the athletes that are in the, you know, they're in the side, you know, that are waiting, they keep looking up at me like, Hey coach, this is a great idea. I like, got this is this is so stupid. What are you <laughs> yeah. doing? What are you doing? You know, you can see that look on on your athlete's face, you know, like, yeah, yeah, you're you're right. Um yeah. but you're you're right. And the other thing we always forget, uh, no disrespect to the referees, but the referees are going through it totally. as well. So it's just totally. it's just chaos, I think, all all around. But again, we, we managed to to get through it. No, you, you, you coach through it. I think at that point I was jumping up and down with some other uh staff members telling you to call timeout, but I, I, I don't think you saw me from the stands either, but uh, <laughs> I think uh, some of us were trying to get your attention, but uh, no, so you get, you get through that qualify for the Olympics, right? No, uh, um, no better place to do that than in Budapest, Hungary too. I think for, for everybody out there, it's uh, well, that was a challenging situation. It's, it's uh, if you haven't been there yet is our, that's our water polo Mecca, right? In the world. That's the spot where, um, they filled the stadium. It was great, great on these games and, uh, and, and really just a, a wonderful city to be in. But then you go from there, we come back, full-time training continues. And then you start training in this June of 2019 time, post-World League Super Final. And then we have World Championships in Korea and the Pan American Games uh, right after that in Lima, Peru, right? And that overall was a 39-day trip. Right, so talk about coaching through a challenging coaching situation. Yeah. I uh, uh, I was with you guys on the front end of the trip, on the back end of the trip. That back end of the trip, that day 39 on that trip, oh. like it's, uh, it's a brutal opportunity to be around each other. And maybe we'll all feel that day on day 39 of quarantine here. But uh, yes. we'll see what that's like. But uh, maybe walk us through that. Because that's, you know, yeah. had you not qualified in Budapest, or then you would have been obviously shooting to qualify at one of those two events. Um, but still trying to win a, a Pan American Championship and a World Championship, which you did both, in, in I think a very trying circumstance at that time. So. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot, lot to unpack there. I mean, the, the the first thing that that I think of is that you know we didn't know going into when we made the arrangements, uh, we made the arrangements for Pan American Games before World League Super Final hit. So uh, we decided that obviously we got to send our best team to, to the Pan American games, knowing that they, that could be our, our qualifier. Um, but obviously we qualified and too late to make any changes. And so we were, you know, for, like you said, 39 days, uh, we came home for two days. Uh, but that was, that was it. And it was a long trip. Uh, yeah. You, you get a little tired of one another and you just miss, you just miss home. Yeah. Um, 
and you know obviously world championships was uh a great event uh, at the same time um an awful experience in some ways at, at the end of it and then pan american games you know by the, by the end of when we got to lima no disrespect to um to the to the other athletes and coaches and people who put it on but we weren't that excited to be there to be honest right. after everything we had been through at world champs um and to be there knowing that it wasn't a qualifier it was it was difficult to stay motivated we just kept kind of counting the days that's the reality of it and, um but it, it made for a long summer but certainly one of uh one of growth and maybe a little bit more of appreciation for for home yeah Let's let's keep unpacking Korea a little bit too, right? So you're in uh, you're in Gwangju, Korea, right? It's a world championship for for every out there. World championships happen every two years um, in aquatics, right? So where you get folded in with swimming and diving and open water swimming and um, artistic swimming, all those things uh, are, are together. So every two years that happens, um, and uh, so Gwangju, Korea, you're there trying to win a world championship. Um, you had previously won that in 2017. Uh, in Budapest, and before that, in uh, in '15, uh, mm -hmm. in Kazan, Russia. So uh, last summer is won our third third world championship in a row. Um, what, what was that like, kind of navigating that tournament in a place that isn't necessarily? It's the opposite of Budapest, right? We're in Budapest, talked about being the mecca of water polo. South Korea, not necessarily have the tradition or the history of water polo there. So what was it like playing playing that environment? Um, it was great. You know, I thought they they did. Uh, they did a great job. I mean, the one thing that kind of stands out in my mind was, I don't know if people followed this or not, was the the South Korean teams got a little bit of heat, especially their women's team for kind of yeah. sending sending a team that that uh, that you know wasn't clearly was not on par with anyone uh, there. I think one of the games against Hungary, they lost yeah forty to nothing or 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 something something like that, and yeah, yeah. unfortunately to to defend Hungary in that, in that situation you know when you're going through group play goal difference comes in could come into play and so you kind of have to keep keep playing uh but one of the things that that struck me in that is like I'll never forget the first goal that 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 team scored mm -hmm. and to see the joy on their faces and the emotion I mean it's like the bench is crying yeah uh, we had this like magazine and this magazine cover when we were over in in South Korea of of uh, people on the bench crying and kind of hugging each other. And it was just yeah. a good reminder that like, you know what, no matter whether you're on the very top or where you're on the, on kind of the lower end of things, the emotion is, is the same in, in a lot of ways. And uh, I thought they did a great job of hosting it. The facilities were, were awesome that we stayed in, usually at world championships, you stay in hotels, you don't stay in a, like right. in a village. And uh, this time it was like an Olympic village, essentially, which was really neat to to get a sense, especially for those who haven't been to Olympic Games. It's great preparation to kind of be in that village type environment and eating in a big cafeteria yeah. with all the athletes. Um, I, I thought it was it was really well done and, and uh, certainly happy with how we played as well. We had a we had an awesome time. The last game was was just pouring rain. Um, so not something you necessarily envision. Uh, however, we, we, we played, I thought we played very well in, in the final, especially defensively. And it's great to win our, our third world championship in a row. Yeah, some great images from that game. I thought, you know, some great photos that have come out of that and you guys playing in the rain and, um, uh, and, and remind everybody who you played in the semis and in the finals there to, 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 win, to win that medal. Yeah, we played Australia, which is probably maybe our most difficult uh, game. Yeah. We played them in the in the semis, and uh, um, we won seven to two. So, mm -hmm. you know, I thought we were great defensively, obviously, but really struggled scoring the ball. They have a nice, really good good team and a yeah. uh, good young goaltender who played well. And um, you know, we showed a kind of a lot of heart, and then uh, we played Spain in the final, which you know for us has probably yeah. been our biggest rival over the last, really since sure. I've been doing this, I guess right. since 2012, since playing them in the Olympic final. Yeah. Um, they always seem to, to kind of, be there at the end playing. We played them in the final in 2017 as well, and uh, that game was uh, fairly close early, but we were able to play, uh, kind of pull away in in the second half. Got it. You really contribution from everyone i specifically remember ashley johnson playing having a phenomenal game yeah. and um 
and uh yeah we we really kind of enjoyed and just enjoyed and soaked in the the rain that you know this team um as much as we haven't seen that that much adversity uh when adversity hits even if it's something like rain um or just mm-hmm. playing in a, in a tough game against a great opponent like spain they they thrive in those conditions and uh they they were thriving in in that moment in the finals it was really neat to be able to to see them kind of step up their game and play probably our our best game of the summer in in that finale yeah yeah that's great to try to peek at that moment i think that's one of the challenges i think when on the outs for people on the outside looking in right you you peak you try to win in yeah. at world world league super final right you qualify for the olympics and somehow you got to keep climbing and try to peak at, in korea and then come home for two days um, and something happened in those last two days as well on the way home uh, from Korea that I think brought some challenges as well, right? Just, you know, you talk about that game happening and winning, be, being Spain, yeah. winning a gold medal, and then, uh, you know, um, then trying to get on the plane in the next 36 hours or so after that. Um, and I'd love for you to touch a little bit on that, on the challenge of the team yeah. kind of going through that, come home for a couple of days and then uh, try to fly and then fly from again, Korea to LA, and then two days LA to Lima, Peru, south, uh, for then another championship where, uh, you know, you still want to be the best in Peru, we're the best team on our continent all the time, right? So um, maybe speak a little bit about the challenges beginning after winning that gold medal and then moving forward. Yeah, yeah I mean, I think it's pretty well documented uh, with that accident. You know, uh, we usually we have a, we had a, we had a great evening. We, we, after we won, we, we with the men's team, women's team, and all the families. And uh, we went to this. We had a great meal um, at this Korean restaurant, obviously, and uh, this cool place. We like sit down on the floor, and you're eating, and you know the men's, and women's teams are connecting, and it's just it was just a lot of good good energy. Um, yeah. And uh, you know, I'll never forget this. Like we usually uh, we usually meet kind of before we go our separate ways, and. We meet it. We have this tradition of giving out a, a hat to kind of like the uh, to like the MVP of of the game uh, or most inspirational, and the players kind of pass it around and uh, gave out the hat. And I swear, after every one of these things, I, I always say like, you know, be safe. You know, let's make sure we take care of ourselves and and be safe. And this mm-hmm. was the one time, I literally the one time, and it still kind of haunts me. Not that me saying it they probably don't even listen to me anymore but this is the one time i said i didn't say it and so we all kind of go our separate ways and players you know go out to just kind of blow off some steam and have some fun and you know um uh, i'll never forget i was just in my in my room and uh we had gotten back to to the to the dorms and dan uh clad had woke me up i forget what what time it was at 2 33 and yeah, he just kind of sits yeah. sits up on the bed next to me, and he's very calm. Uh, and he said, you know, the very first thing, which was great, um, is he's just like, you know, hey, everything's. I think everything. I think he said, I think everything's okay. Um, so it made me calm down, but I could see the look on his face, like, uh oh, something happened. And uh, then he proceeded to tell me some of the details, but we really didn't know a whole lot, and that was. Uh, that was frightening. I think from that time uh, until we located everyone uh, was just the most nerve wracking experience I think I've, I've had probably in my, my coaching career. It's just, you know, you, you especially when you become a father, you, you, um, you have a little bit of a different perspective. And, and uh, when that happened, it was like, you know, you're constantly calling people and the athletes are all over the place. We had some that were back in the hotel, some that were out. Everyone's experience was a little bit differently, uh, was a little bit different. Uh, to be able to just l- track everyone down and not knowing if everyone was okay, uh, that was the scariest part. But once we made sure we had everyone, uh, then it came down to like, okay, obviously, I think it's well documented the page and um, Kaylee, especially Kaylee kind of. Right took the brunt of it. And, um, then it was just more about kind of getting, uh, making sure that they were being taken care of, uh, by the people, but it was a, it was a mix of emotions, you know, it's like, and it's crazy. It's just such a reminder that like, as this pandemic is, is that, 
you know, tomorrow is not guaranteed for any of us. And just brings us back to reality. I mean, we're in the highest of highs, like, right. Celebrating, right. like we, we are right. world champions, you know, I mean, it's just like, oh, it's the best feeling in the world. Right. And then boom, a, a moment like that, it just takes, it's just a kick in the gut, man. And it right. takes you right back to, to reality. It's like, ah, oh, yeah, it's like, you can't celebrate this. You got more important things to worry about, but thankfully, uh, unfortunately for Kaylee and, and Paige, and, you know, I think we're all kind of still dealing with it, you know, yeah. um, on different levels, depending on who you are. And that, that, that stuff's not going to go away. Um, but hopefully in the end, I mean, we all made it out okay, uh, unlike a couple of people, unfortunately. And yeah. hopefully we can use it to just make us a little bit stronger and a little bit uh, more humble and just give us a better perspective on, on things similar to this pandemic. Yeah. No, no doubt. I mean, had this pandemic not happened, I think it would have been a really interesting story just about some of the challenges that you would have, the micro, again, the pandemic is the macro, right? But this micro small level of water polo that yeah. we're at of challenges that you guys had to face along the way to Tokyo. Um, this is, that was, you know, pretty traumatic experience, I think, for a lot of the, the team members. Yeah. Obviously, we talked about Kaylee and Paige, but just even there were some other team members out and to see kind of what happened at that uh, there and to witness some of those things is, is a pretty traumatic experience. Um, and I think, I think what maybe cu people would be curious to hear is then how do you go from that traumatic experience and go back to what I just said, which was you're dealing with this, everyone's running around trying to get to the airport, you know, all night, up all night, trying to make sure everyone's safe. Kaylee and, and, uh, and, and, you know, our, our, our wonderful sports medicine manager, Larnie and our doctor, Seth Small, it's worth knowing them here, right? Got to stay back in Korea um and 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 take care of them and then you guys are on a plane to get home repack your bags and then come compete at the pan American, and then again go to peru so i think it would be interesting to hear how you talk about getting to that point right and for our men who were there right they had to then come back heal up some of them had some some cuts and bruises right to heal up as quickly as possible and then try to qualify for the olympics as they yeah. did right in lima which is uh i think what was the goal all summer but i think the goal became yeah that much sweeter when that having to deal with that adversity along the way right to get there but how did you transition the team the athletes the staff from what happened in korea to then being in lima and trying to keep it going for the, the end of this 39-day journey uh, i mean i i don't know if there's a way to transition i wouldn't say we necessarily transition well it's it's really really difficult to it and I think that was part of the reason which made the trip so long you know when something like that happens you just you just want to be at home like you just as we all probably feel right now right you just you just want to hug your loved ones and keep keep them close and tight and you you don't want to go like the last thing you want to do is go to Lima Peru I mean I, I and I I remember getting home and just <laughs> I give my, my wife and family a hard time because they, they have her on vacation in Florida. So we came home for two days before we went to, to Lima and I, yeah. it was, a, I was an emotional wreck. And I just remember just crying, just, I didn't want to, I didn't want to go. I didn't want to get on the plane. Yeah. Um, so it wasn't easy. Um, fortunately, uh, we were very fortunate for a couple of things. One, as you mentioned, our staff, our medical staff, I mean, I, there, there's no one more professional than uh, than Saint Larnie, as we call her, who's a who's our athletic trainer, medical manager. I mean, she is as good as it comes, and as professional um, and as kind-hearted as as anyone that I think you'll you'll come across. And she uh, made a, made the choice, obviously, to stay back along with our doc, uh, Seth Schmoll, who. You know, this isn't his full time gig, right? He's got his own stuff back back at home and he's volunteering his time to come spend right. with us. And now he's right. got to stay an extra four days, not to make Kaylee feel bad, but he's staying right. an extra four or five cool. days in South Korea to make sure and then you just imagine like the language barrier, right? You got someone with a is a very serious leg injury, uh who's been through a traumatic event and Seth is there trying to deal with the doctors um, who don't speak English that well. And so those, those two uh, are really kind of the, the heroes for us. And then we we're fortunate that like in some ways that we hadn't planned to take Kaylee to Pan American games. Um, she wasn't going to go on that trip. So um, 
you know, kind of ironically, she, she wasn't, that wasn't the plan. And, yeah. uh, we had to make one, one change, but, uh, it, the whole time during Pan American games, I think we were all just kind of in a, in a daze and, and the transition was, was really difficult. And at times even like this, although we can't like play, but every time they hopped in the water, it was like, you know, that was their, their, uh, their way to express themselves and real, real, kind of forget everything else that was going on. And so that I think just continuing to play water polo, I think was, was actually very helpful in some ways. Yeah. Yeah. And, it's, and, and, and the good thing is, is once you kind of got there, while the stakes are still high to win a continental championship, right. Mm-hmm. You had kind of qualification behind you and that was at least able to check that box along the way. But, uh, but let's set the stage now with team, team lands in uh, in Peru, right. In Lima. And now you're in, uh, uh, in South America, you got to play teams where um, you're not as not as matched up with us, right? Trying to find the best words to use there. Okay, so you're, you're winning some games by a lot of yeah. goals. Um, I'll set the table for everyone else. A few of our staff members who are listening and are watching here were there as well. But you know, you have a brand new water polo venue that was built in the kind of the mm-hmm. outskirts of Lima, and then uh, a brand new village that was just recently built on another side, not next to the pool, yeah. and then based on these new roster spots, some of us were in a hotel in, in downtown. Yeah. I think we were the lucky ones, you know, and yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. but all these are like miles and miles apart. Right. And, uh, and so for every game now you're kind of going through these kind of dirt roads on some small vans, you know, little vans and we're going through these to, to get to this uh, new water pole venue. So it's not the most, um, Again, start, we started in Budapest, which is kind of like the, the, the standard of mm-hmm. water, international water polo. And then we're, we're in Korea in this brand new place. Okay, success in both these places. Now we're in a development water polo scenario, right? Where, where teams are developing, the environment is developing. And now and we've dealt with all this adversity just to get to this point, right? So, um, and some adversity at the end of this, which we'll get to, right? Um, trying to leave Lima as well. So. Maybe take us through just those those games and those teams, right, to inevitably win the gold medal against Canada um, yeah. in dominant fashion. For those who have been following along, I think goes goes without saying that was a it's a big win there to win the gold medal in Lima. Yeah, I think there's a few things that uh, that I take from from that experience as a whole. Is one, as you were kind of alluding to, uh, the the there's a certain part of of Lima that was you know fairly affluent uh, but then where we were mostly right. where the village was and where the games were uh, you know not the most affluent area you know uh, uh, and every single time that 30 minute bus ride was, it was a humbling humbling experience yeah. and you know just watching the faces even of our athletes as they drive through some of these towns um, and see some of these people on the streets uh, and the lack of cleanliness and uh, just the looks of, of some of the homes and stuff, you know, it, it, again, talk about perspective is a, it gave us a great perspective for what we should all be so thankful for. And, um, you know, kind of always looking for personally for me, and kind of always looking for things for our team that humble us uh, and that keep us grounded. Uh, and this was obviously it wasn't something I created; it was something that was just kind of stared at us right in, in our faces. And uh, so that was, I think, a great experience for us. Yeah. And the second thing was just yeah, the the competition. You know, and we you know we we beat these teams pretty easily, but. Uh, we we don't we don't go into it you know uh we st- the team still wants to play well they're they're really funny i mean there's like yeah. they and i something i love about them they just love yeah. to play with each other and they love to play very well and so it's kind of tough to pull back the reins but i think it it gave us uh we we appreciate and we respect even the opponents you know even if we beat them 30 to 1 um, we love the fact that they're competing and how to see them, you know, it, it reminded me a lot of like, uh, the dream team mm. and what you saw a lot was like, what I remember of 92 Barcelona Olympics is like yeah. the opposing team literally in warm up coming over and asking to take a picture with yeah. a certain, yeah. with the team and yeah. even the coaches coming over, Hey, hey oh. you know, can we take a picture with you guys? I'm like, hey, the game, the game is about <laughs> to start. Play. Yeah, um, they're just happy to be yeah. there and to uh, 
to experience it. And, and I don't think even sometimes like they don't want you to like take it easy on them. Right. They're like, sure. no, we want to see it. This is so cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, you think that they would be embarrassed, but they're not. And it's, it's really refreshing to, to see. And so that's, that's what I remember. And I think the last thing I remember is just, you know, we, we were playing with an 11 player roster at that time. That's right. what the rules were. And with one goalie, so 10 field players and the night before the final game, uh, one of our players actually caught a virus that was pretty bad and got, yeah. got sick. Um, and then that morning, uh, we weren't sure whether she was going to be able to play. And then that morning, uh, Doc said, she can't play. She's got to, st- she's got to stay back at home. I'm like, Oh, okay. So now we got nine field players. Great. Yeah. And then we hop on the bus, uh, to go. And one of the, <laughs> one of the players goes, you know, basically, excuse me and walks off the bus and proceeds to uh <laughs> let loose a little bit on yeah, on, yeah. on the side and it's like oh my god does she have the same thing and yeah. so we had to send her back yeah and so all of a sudden we have eight field players and one goalie and so you know and it's disappointing this is this is where the mentality of our team is just so unique mm-hmm. i think it, they were extremely disappointed for those two players obviously you never wish someone ill um but at the same time, you could see we were kind of looking for an edge and some adversity right. um, and some motivation. And you could see the rest of them go like, yeah, like bring it on. You know, yeah. this is well, now we have eight. This is great. Yeah. This is yeah. like uh, it's just embracing this adversity as more of an opportunity um, or a challenge, a neat mm-hmm. little challenge to see if we can overcome it. And that's that's a testament to the to the characters that that I that I get to coach. It was pretty cool. And then to be able to see them like uh, perform and, and the way that they did was, was really neat. Yeah. It was really impressive. Right. You ab- absorb that challenge and on the way you're about to get on this bus. You're not only playing in the gold medal Pan American game, you're playing Canada, which we, we love our neighbors to the North, but it's still a rivalry, right? It's a, yeah. it's, a, it's yeah. a big rivalry. These are, these are more physical games, right? There's a more emotion involved in these games. And, uh, um, you know, for them, they're excited to be there because regardless of the outcome of the game, they get to qualify for the Olympics as we kind of started talked about in the beginning, but still a tough, still, still a tough matchup. And um, I think about that a lot in, the, in relation to this pandemic, people wonder why these big sporting events and these big things need to be canceled. But the two athletes you're talking about, they got sick in the village. They caught the, virage, uh, the virus in the village in these, the big cafeteria, the dorms of all this interaction with the athletes in kind of what is a mini Olympics and the Pan American uh, games, those viruses kind of catch quickly and can move. Yeah. Um, and so it's nothing to laugh about now, right? We were, we're fighting through that small thing then, but you wonder when people ask, hey, the Olympics get postponed and, you know, these big sporting events, Wimbledon this morning, right, gets canceled, right? And you bring people close together, you know, not to overstate the obvious, right? It's kind of easy yeah. for these things to spread. And uh, I think about that sometimes and, um, as you get through it, but somehow you guys, like you said, embrace that adversity and, and win that gold medal and cap off a 39 day journey uh, between Korea and Lima, you know, to, to get to that yeah. point. So what was it like after that beating Canada in that gold medal game? And now we're, now we're trying to get back home. So maybe transition us back home as we keep going through this timeline. Yeah. yeah I think at that point, it's just the end of the summer. And usually we, we take a, take a good little, little break and kind of, relax our minds. We all knew that we were going to go into full-time training. So there was a lot of training ahead of us. And yeah, so most yeah. people go out and just enjoy themselves and find some fun things to do. And uh, we came back in the fall and um, we had, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, I, I sound like I'm complaining, but you know, it's, it's, and I, I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't trade uh, with anyone. Um, I enjoy yeah. coaching this team and it's great coaching a, a ton of talented athletes. Uh, however, the challenges are that, you know, this, the more success we have, uh, in some ways, the, the difficult, the more difficult it is to kind of keep the fire going um, mm-hmm. and keep the motivation. And that was, a, a, uh, I think, a challenge a little bit in the fall, just knowing how far out the Olympic Games were. Uh, the nice thing that, w- that we did, and we, we had a, re- a very unique experience, and it's almost ironic that that we 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 did this in September is that we went on a silent retreat, mm-hmm. uh, a ten day silent retreat. We were silent for I think seven days or eight, eight days. Uh, we went to this place in Colorado and 
really kind of just worked on our minds um, and, and the mindfulness uh, that's associated with uh, just trying to be, be silent and be a little bit more aware of our surroundings and kind of our thoughts. And uh, at times you, we went through those days going like, I don't know if I can go another day, um, just being silent, not talking to anyone. And ironically, uh, you know, you're, we were in isolation there and now it's like, it's, it's, we're, we're, you know, yeah, we can talk to our loved ones here and we can zoom or whatever it may be, but there's some similarities there through our process. Um, and the lessons that we learned in that 10 day experience and kind of take those lessons learned and bring it into this one right now is, yeah. is, uh, is pretty poetic in, in some ways, but the, the fall was, was a difficult time, but, um, just to stay motivated, it, it ended with a couple tournaments in Canada and Princeton, and that was yeah. uh, great to always play some games, and especially to play some games outside of our typical uh, California. We don't get to play very many home games, and right. uh, um, it's always great to get outside of California. Just the enthusiasm and uh, uh, the energy is just different than, uh, no offense to my the rest of my Californians, but it's yeah. just different. And it's in some ways they, I think they, everyone else appreciates a uh, good water polo a little bit more than the rest of us do. And it's, it was neat to really, really neat to be back in, in Princeton and kind of see that reception and, and be able to host a tournament was, was really cool. Yeah. And I think, yeah, I, I agree that we've had some great experiences over the years playing games outside of California and, and the plan is to continue those and keep going. So I know, uh, you know, people are anxious to see the team play again, and uh, and we'll definitely do that. Um, and hopefully, anxious to come back to Indianapolis or the Midwest, and you know, keep uh, uh, keep doing that despite kind of what we're going through now. So that's that's the yeah. plan moving forward. So you're uh, so let's let's fast forward then, right? So you got to the fall. That's the win. Those two tournaments you talked about, Canada and Princeton. That's December of nineteen, uh, which seems like a decade ago at this point. Yeah, you know? and <laughs> does yeah. yeah. Uh, so then the team goes to Australia for 10 days in January, comes home for a little bit, right? Go to Colorado Springs, go to Holland, right? Uh, Holland and Colorado Springs for some training. You come home, as you kind of mentioned at the very beginning of the talk, and that's when this happened, right? So that's kind of when all this, this went down. This is uh, to kind of get us to where we're at today. So, I mean, I think a lot of, yeah. a lot of coaches are asking out there, now, now you're at present day, you went through this whole 10 month cycle we're, we're talking about, but what, what if you had to sum it up, like advice you have for coaches, you know, to to keep coaching through not only this adversity but any of these adversities that we've been talking about along the way? Like, what are what are some guiding um, principles or or things you can advise these coaches on? Yeah, I mean, a few things come to my mind. Um, the 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 first thing is, and I, I always say this to to the team, is that adversity always appears. It's always going to come, and just the expectation of it coming, I think, is is the most important is the most important thing. Um, if we just go about our lives uh, thinking that everything's going to be fine, um, and we it's we can have a positive outlook on things, but still have uh, a realistic view. And um, so, when times like this happen, uh, when we go through this, it's like you you just you know it's coming, and um, for me, like a couple of the most important things I think of when something like this, I mean, one is like, we, you know, we, we define ourselves. I know I define myself based on, uh, or judge myself uh, on how I respond or how we respond when things don't go well. I mean, anyone can win and be a good winner, right? Uh, when things are going well and we're having some, some success, it's like, oh, this is, I'm happy, I'm fine, I'm motivated. Um, when things don't go well, I think we, we learn a little bit more about ourselves. And this is, it's during these times, I think, where uh, leadership is pronounced a little bit more. Uh, we have an idea of kind of who the real true leaders are um, of our sport or our country or our little group. Um, we have an idea of who has the courage. I always say like in adverse times, courage counts. Courage and character count. And, you know, this is like similar to what I was saying with the team in terms of like when we saw that adversity, when we in, in Lima, 
It's like when something like this happens, there's, there's certainly a little bit of mourning. Um, and I think there always will be as you're going through something. Sure. But there's also this like trigger that it's like, okay, it's game on. I mean, this is, this is a challenge. And whether that challenge is something literally so simple as like, it's a challenge to sit here in this chair right. and not go outside. I mean, it, it, that's really what, what it is. And so um, that's kind of the, the mentality is probably most, most important. And, you know, where, where the team is now, I mean, we're a little bit all over the place. I think they, they handle adversity well, but the, the reality is like we were in a place where January was like, it was on. I mean, we started with a good trip to Australia um, against an awesome team, really talented team, well-coached team. And then we got back from Australia and this was part of our plan. February and March were going to be tough. And uh, we were going to get a bulk of our work done during those two months. And, and I'll tell you what, you know, March 18th was the last day we practiced. And leading up to that, we, uh, I had challenged the team in, in a lot of ways. And the way that they were responding was incredible. Uh, the improvement that you could see on a daily basis and we're building these blocks and we're just getting better and better. And there's literally, a, there were moments in the last two weeks where I saw glimpses of just incredible things like just, wow, mm -hmm. that was, and there's, I, I don't, they'll even, they'll be the first to attest. Like there's not very many wow moments for me, but like mm -hmm. there were some wow moments. I'm like, man, that was really, really, really good, really special. And then something like this happens. It just, you know, we, we were six weeks away from naming the Olympic team. Right. And, um, you know, when you've been thinking about not just for over the last three years, but maybe your whole lifetime, and you're this close, you're six yeah. weeks away from not only naming the Olympic team, but really starting to, like, get to en enjoy really the fun part about right. the last three months are the best, or the best. You name the team. We're hosting these events, like the yeah. excitement, and you can just feel it and you can taste it. And there's some that we're playing so well um, and committing so much to, and now, boom, it's gone. Uh, and maybe it's not gone forever, but the, the thought of it being 15 or 16 months away, you know, there's a ton of fear that goes through. I can't yeah. speak for them, but, you know, the, one, the fear and health of the fear of, um, not being healthy and not being safe, you know, personally and for your loved ones. I think the fear of uncertainty, not knowing what tomorrow is going to hold, what next month is going to hold for any one of us, the fear of losing your position on the team. There's people yeah. who were in a great position who had been playing really well. Um, that's scary. Um, and then honestly, the, the daunting thought for them, and I feel, I feel for them, the daunting thought of going through this whole process again for the next 16 months. Yeah. when you were that close is I, I and again I don't want to speak for them but I'm sure there are athletes on our team that are contemplating whether they want to do it again right. uh, and I and I get it um, I totally get it because it's they they put a lot into this into this process so I I feel for them and there's a little bit of grieving here and we kind of have to let that grieving happen um, but uh, you know hopefully we can, and I have confidence in this group to be able to, to respond. And, um, but there's only one thing we can do now, really, and that's kind of take care of ourselves. Yeah, and I'll speak on behalf of just kind of everybody, um, all of us water polo fans and people who are, who are keep with your team. You have an, an unlimited amount of empathy. The athletes have an unlimited amount of empathy from our side, right? You're right. It's not a, well, it's not a short-term goal. This is for everybody a lifetime goal to compete in the Olympic Games. And, uh, and, and, and we get that adversity. And I think, uh, you know, there's hope and we want to continue to, to provide that hope for everyone to, to kind of keep fighting, fighting through that. And so um, appreciate you, Coach. I think one of the things I've always appreciated about you and, and what we've been able to do over the years is be really open and um, honest with everybody out there, right? So you've always yeah. been uh, able to share, you know, pretty openly all the things that uh, you're, you're going through, teams going through, and it's, uh, and I think that only helps us all get better and, and, and learn from this. And so I appreciate that. And thank you. And, uh, certainly want to get to a few questions from, from people, you know, that are out there as we, uh, 
as we as we get to the end here you know um, yeah i i i i'd like to say just a couple please. more things is is one is is um we got to take the positives from from this too and the, and the lessons learned right um and going through this I, again i um I, I think it's a humbling experience for all and I, and i can't help but to think that you know i i guess I w i'm not necessarily a, a huge religious person but um i do believe in some higher power and uh it's almost like this is kind of a reality check for, for all of us. Like just bring us back down to earth a little bit and be a little bit more grounded to have a little better perspective on, on things. And um, as I told the athletes, you know, if any one of them are doing it just for the medal, then this, that's not the reason why. And so if anything for us on a, on a positive level, it just gives us a, a little bit more meaning um, in, in our life and in our sport life. So, when we hop back in the pool and when I go back to coaching, um, knowing that it can be taken away from you at any point, just, uh, you know, it allows you to, to, to have a better perspective on thing and uh, enjoy the moment a little bit more and let the things that are most important to you kind of guide your life and the values that you live with guide your life. And I can't help but think, I mean, I, I'm, I kind of go back and forth from being pessimistic and then also really optimistic and, um i'm just you know there's part of me that's like thinking 14 months from now or whenever 15 16 months from now and july 23rd when they have the opening ceremonies in in tokyo uh in 2021 uh, the, the image i have in my mind of like walking into that stadium during opening ceremonies yeah. which already is the coolest experience yeah. ever yeah. um but then to imagine that we're not just doing it alone, right? We're like sharing that entire experience with the whole world because the whole world is going through something yeah. that we can all share in. And I've always said the Olympics are the greatest display of world peace there is um, mm -hmm. for those three weeks. And I can't think of a better event to bring us all together after, hopefully after a time in which uh, we've been able to get through uh, these obstacles and this adversity and uh, to be able to celebrate that with the rest of the world would be literally I, maybe the, the best, one of the best experiences of my, my life. Yeah. No doubt. Looking, I think we're all looking forward to that cathartic moment, right? Of, yeah. uh, bringing the world together after this. And there's no doubt, right? It's a good, good image to keep in all our heads as we, as we look ahead here. Yeah. Um, so we uh, we got we got a few people still hanging on here and uh, and with us and um, appreciate you guys uh, uh, hanging out with us and I think uh, again appreciate coach for 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 sharing through this I think uh, you kind of said it yourself there but uh, the uh, uh, one of the co questions that's come up is you know with all this success you know what 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 keeps you what keeps you humble you know through this and uh, maybe speak a little bit of how how you stay humble but also keep the players motivated right through all this success. I know, you know, complacency can happen too during that process, but uh, uh, got a couple of questions like that here. So maybe you can speak a little bit to that. Uh, yeah. I, you know, I don't know what keeps me humble. I mean, I, I, I'm thankful for, uh, you know, thankful for my family and my parents um, and the family I currently have that uh, I think is, is, done a good job of instilling some perspective in me um and when you deal with you know when you have certain pain points in your life you know some, some of the young athletes haven't really been through anything that difficult and so uh, th this is where there's beauty in in difficult times because it, it gives you that perspective and keeps keeps you humble um and there, you know i've had a, a few things i'm blessed to live a live a great life uh, but there's been some challenging times um, and some bumps in the road that I think have allowed me, have given me the opportunity to have that perspective. I think it's well known. My, you know, my brother passed four years ago, and you know, when you lose a, um, a sibling or a real close relative like that, it, it's uh, it, it, you begin to realize like that that this is uh, sport is is just something you should enjoy and you should have fun with. So I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for that. And to keep them motivated, it, it's honestly, it's a, 
at times it's a daily challenge, you know, I think, um, everyone beats to, to their own drum. Um, everyone's motivated for different, different reasons. And, and it, I think you have to get to know your athletes probably more than, more than anything. Uh, so, you know, what, what motivates them, um, again, from, from a team standpoint, they, my team, they might not enjoy it all the time, but, uh, they enjoy adversity. Uh, so any type of adversity that even adversity that I create, uh, they respond well to, and it kind of keeps them sharp and motivated. Yeah, no, for sure. It's good. I think one great thing about all this, I agree with you, just that we're all going to have a greater perspective and gratitude when this is all over. And I, uh, um, we're all kind of experiencing that now. And so I'm, I'm, I'm appreciative of that, of, of, of these trials and we're aware of it, but we're, we're all going to have a, a greater perspective and gratitude out of this. And if any of you guys with these questions are looking for some humility, you know, right when we walk out of this, go, go do some dishes, you know, take out the trash. You know, I think, uh, nice. That's keeping us all humble right now, you know. <laughs> uh, I'm happy to stay on this call for another three hours. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we know we know what's behind us right now. Um, yeah, try try homeschooling for two weeks. I mean, uh, that's been humbling. Yeah, uh, jeez. Oh, yeah. So you have you're you're in the same situation as myself, and probably many others are on the call. We have two, at least two kids in the house, two working uh, spouses, right, partners in there. Um, and homeschooling at the same time and somehow to manage that. So I'm going to, I'm with you. I'm, let's milk this for another, uh, you know, 45, <laughs> 45 minutes or so. Who knows? Uh, <laughs> Cause uh, it's trash day and I got a lot of cleaning to do. Um, but uh, uh, I just got more questions as they come in here. Um, you know, people are staying home right now. So we get this question a lot. So maybe take us through this, uh, just a little bit of this, like some uh, uh, Jack here is asking, what he can do to stay fit yeah. at home and it'd probably be some good lessons to learn from how the your team is trained fit at home right during the same time because it's not just uh, it's not just you jack it's all of us right everyone's got to try to stay fit during this time <laughs> while we're at yeah. home yeah. yeah i mean they don't our, our athletes uh, don't have access to pools right now right. obviously so um they've implemented and they were on uh somewhat of a regimented strength program but now since the games have been postponed uh we've got to change the goals a little bit and now it's more just about general fitness so we've incorporated uh, uh most of them if not all of them have stationary bikes that they're using or running they're doing some type of activity whether it's biking or running mm -hmm. uh every day and they're kind of building into it as our strength strength and conditioning coach said the other day it's like we had a couple of athletes that were already running like half marathons it's like Okay, guys, um, that's the kind of <laughs> uh, mentality. They, well, it's incredible, but at the yeah. same time, it's like it's a little dangerous to start doing too much. Um, if right. you're doing something that that you're not necessarily used to and being on land, then you got to make sure that you're kind of easing into it. So uh, running, biking, uh, there's plenty of exercises that you can do. I've seen some cool stuff online. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. You can surf. It's, it's really neat what, uh, what all the, the athletes, water polo athletes and coaches are kind of putting together um, to incorporate some water polo skills. I was doing something with my son in, in the backyard, doing some sit-ups where we're just passing the ball back and back and oh, forth. Cool. Yeah. Um, you know, things like that. You got to be, you got to be creative. Uh, and that's the nice thing about being, being able to connect with people on, on the internet. Yeah. I was about to say, that's a good point. Like the social media, honestly, getting a little more engaged in social media, we, I feel like we spent all these years saying like, all right, kind of curb your social media usage, curb your screen time, but yeah. screen time is kind of all we have now. Um, so it, it actually is a good time for, I think, for everybody out there to start following a lot more of our athletes and following even the USA water polo channels and uh, every other water polo, total water polo, every water yeah. polo channel that's out there um, because everyone's putting out some stuff. Cap seven's been putting out some stuff. So yeah. putting out some stuff. Every individual coach is putting out some stuff. Every club is putting out stuff and, it's like to your point it's all great um so if you don't have a uh a, a so twitter account yet maybe it's the time to get one and start finding all these exercises because something new is uh something new is coming up every day and it's it's pretty cool to see everybody rally around it you know? yeah uh, uh i'm gonna combine a couple of questions into one here um yeah. uh some people are looking uh mac here's looking for some some book recommendations or some resource recommendations right throw out there maybe some of the, a couple of your favorite things and maybe some of the, some people that have been helpful along the way here, mentors and in, in, in water polo. Um, so maybe some resources and people that we can share, right. With yeah. others that uh, would be good to, uh, good for other people to tap into. 
Well, I, I, I would combine those two things to say uh, any Coach Wooden book is 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 wonderful uh, and a great opportunity to learn. And that, that I say I combine it because uh, he's definitely a, a mentor for me and someone I've always looked up to uh, and was fortunate enough to spend a little bit of time with and, and get to know. And I mean, his stuff is timeless. And I think yeah. he'll go down as one of the greatest coaches of all time and talk about perspective and have an understanding of uh, uh, not just about trying to be the best in sport, but trying to be the best in, in everything you do in life. I mean, he's uh, it's one of the best, but um, I think you, you, the other thing I, I want to say, and this is for some of the coaches out there. Um, I have two coaches when I was, when I was young that really inspired me. I think are the reason why I coach today. Uh, one is, is a coach by the name of Kevin Perry. Uh, who was a swim coach in Northern California and then moved down to Southern California. And, and uh, he was tough, um, really, you know, very disciplined, very focused. He was the first coach that I had that uh, even at a really young age, he was, he was, and this is why I'm so into the, the, the mental side of things. Uh, he taught us visualization. He made us read books that were, um, that were all about kind of mental preparation more than physical preparation. Uh, and so that's kind of stuck with me. And then I had a, a little league baseball coach and basketball coach who was able to help us find the fun and fundamentals. And for the young, uh, the coaches out there who are coaching young athletes, uh, I can't, tell you how important that is uh he was someone who made every little drill that we did um whether it was you know dribbling a basketball with these glasses that had tape on the bottom you know mm -hmm. working on our like our ability to be able to handle the ball without looking down at, at the ball or yeah, yeah. fielding ground balls he just made everything fun with his energy and enthusiasm and his creativity and, and the drills and i think uh that just gave me a love for like uh, not just the sport itself, yeah. but it gave me a love for coaching and like how inspiring uh, those those coaches were were to me. Yeah, it's amazing to think of that. I, I, I love when people talk about the influence of youth coaches and high school coaches. Those are the ones that inspire you the most. Yeah, the rest of the co rest of coaching is a lot of that is maintenance, right? Like you're yeah. maintaining the motivation and what has been built for people beyond, and you got to inspire them, but it starts with the youth and at the high school levels. So I, I, I like hearing you. Yeah. I, 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 I literally loved swimming more than anything when I was a kid. Yeah. And I think right. back, I'm like, that, that was awful. Yeah. Um, but the reason, <laughs> honestly, the reason why, I, the reason why I loved it was because of my coach. Yeah. So we have a responsibility as water polo coaches, um, especially the ones, um, and I don't want to diminish my, responsibility as a coach here in this country but the young ones yeah. the ones that are coaching our youth um you're going to make them love it or you're going to make them hate it right. that's ultimately what it, what it comes down to um so there's a big responsibility and i, I certainly am incredibly appreciative of, of all the uh the coaches out there who coach in club and high school and even younger that inspire their kids to, to be a part of the sport it's it's, yeah. it's awesome yeah you know, it's a, it's uh I'll diminish your role a little bit. Yeah, they're they're more important than you, coach. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah they are. They are. <laughs> we, it's we true. Need, yeah, we got to keep them inspired. So it's it's much appreciated of uh, what everybody's doing out there. Um, uh, I think that I think that's great. A um, couple other questions that come up. You brought up the uh, um, the mindset, right? Like you had this coach who really worked on your mindset, you know, at that point. And and what are some other things that the mental game? Because that's the hard part, right? We you mentioned yeah. this earlier, like all of us are going through this kind of highs and lows. There's good days, there's bad days. There's times we feel really optimistic. And then there's times we feel like, man, this is, this is going to be hard to get through. What are, maybe what are some things that um, your athletes are doing or, or, and, and can share with other athletes that are working on the mind game? Yeah, I think it's really difficult for the athletes. Um, I think they need some, uh, some guidance. Uh, you know, one of the things that, that we've picked up on and the, uh, uh, is just mindfulness. We have a sports psychologist that works with us and uh, we do a decent amount of mindfulness where you know, mindfulness is essentially just like your, the awareness of, of your own thoughts. Um, 
people look at it as like meditation of like being in the corner and just like yeah. trying to not think about anything. But mindfulness is more about being aware of the thoughts that are going yeah. through your mind and then your ability to be able to choose, um, you know, how you want to handle those, those thoughts. And so we, we're lucky enough to have a sports psych that kind of works us through some of that. Honestly, some of the athletes take to it. Some of them don't take to it. Uh, sure. I think they will all take to it at some point in the lives when they, they get a little bit older. Yeah. Um, but it's it's difficult. I it's it's really difficult. I, I think the the only other thing I'd say is just read. Um, there's so much great literature out there nowadays. It's so easy to find stuff online and just about other people's experiences. The more experiences you can draw from, I think it it helps you from uh, mentally and kind of see how other athletes have been able to overcome their hurdles and. Um, I would just be digging around and searching as much as as much as you can. Yeah, yeah. There's there's, there's certainly no shortage of information out there, right? And so I encourage everybody yeah. out there to explore all the resources we've collected a bunch on on USA Water Polo website, and you know we have guys like Brian Alexander helping us through that too, and and getting some info out there. And uh, um, yeah, I encourage everybody to get out there. And the mindfulness stuff, I'd, I'll even plug a couple of things that have been helpful for us as well, like. You know, there's apps like Headspace and Calm that have been uh, really helpful, I think, for a lot of sports teams, you know, to access uh, some mindfulness stuff. And, and you're right, it's not all, you know, hippies meditating in a corner, right? And it doesn't have to be kind of this image we get of meditation. It's, it's something that's really helpful. And so I would encourage everybody to, to uh, get after that. Um, I think just to, uh, to tell, tell our friend Mark St. John here quickly, you know, any chance we can be in Vegas, we'll, we'll be in Vegas. We see the questions coming, brother. We'll, uh, <laughs> we'll, uh, uh, yeah, there's <laughs> always a, a Vegas, there's always a Vegas pitch in there. Uh, maybe, maybe there, there is a chance. There yeah. is a chance. There's always a chance. There's always, there's a, always chance. a chance. So you're saying there's a chance. <laughs> you're saying there's a chance. And I think uh, there's another question. This could be, it's a question from Casey. You're asking about the single funniest memory you have with the team, but uh, that was a good, uh, in 2012, speaking of Vegas, right? And uh, and Mark, right, there was an opportunity for uh, the team before the London games to go to Vegas and be part of the, interact with the O show, right? Out there um, at that time. And uh, yeah. the, the the people there, what was that like? That was, uh, <laughs> that was cool. That was cool. Yeah, um, yeah to kind of see what, what they do. We actually played uh, a, a you know, a water polo game in the O show pool um, and uh, put in some temporary goals in there. And uh, it was, it was, it was really, it was really pretty, uh, pretty special experience to be able to, and just to see what they do. Um, I mean, the talent that they have uh, and the courage that they have is, is quite incredible. We got to meet uh, the basketball team as well. We went out and watched yeah. a couple, a couple of the trainings and, uh, Never forget to see like guys like uh, Demarcus Cousins and Kevin Durant, LeBron James wearing speedos. I mean, our, yeah. <laughs> our girls brought the, you know, they they brought the swimsuits to like, you know, I don't know, just hand them off. Yeah, sure. Uh, and the guys loved them. I mean, they they yeah. they took to it. Uh, but me, like the single funniest moment I've been thinking about this is like, yeah. I'll tell you. Uh, 2011. This is just on a personal side. Yeah. Uh, and people got a good laugh. Uh, in fact, Betsy Armstrong mm-hmm. sent me a video, uh, and Chris sent me a video maybe a year or two ago of, of this moment. It was like uh, in Guadalajara, we were playing Canada to qualify for the Olympics. And if you hadn't heard about the game, it's the longest game yeah. in the history of, of water polo. We, uh, mm-hmm. I don't think we'd ever lost to Canada, but we were down by three. We ended up coming back to tie it. And then, um, went into overtime that's when they had overtime still tied so it went into shootout and it went uh four rounds so our five shooters uh each shot four times um mm. and so 20 shots each and we finally won at the at the very end and we're in guadalajara right and like yeah. you know there's uh sombreros in the stands and uh um, I'm like hanging on a shot clock before, right before the end. Cause I just, I can't even watch anymore. I remember like, yeah. you know, we, we ended up winning and I, I wasn't literally, I wasn't even looking. And then 
Dan comes up to me and he just grabs me and he hugs me like, we did it, we did it. And I literally, he was like grabbing me so hard. I'm like, Dan, I can't breathe. Mm -hmm. And he let go of me. And then all of a sudden this like rush of energy comes and you know, everything starts hitting me like, Oh my God, this was the most amazing game ever. We qualified for the Olympics and mm -hmm. someone had thrown a, a sombrero down uh, on the, the, the catwalk, right. Where the referees mm -hmm. are. And, I saw the sombrero out there and I saw our players jumping in and I'm thinking to myself, like, Oh my God, this is so cool. Yeah. I want to go celebrate with them. And so I just ran down the catwalk and I grabbed the sombrero, just, you know, just not thinking about anything. I'm like, Oh, this is, I'm going to embrace the culture <laughs> of Mexico. And I put right, it on my, yeah. I put it on my head and I proceeded to think, okay, the team is out there celebrating. Now I'm going to run as fast as I can down the catwalk and do this incredible flip. Um, this is my plan. I was like, I'm going to do this incredible flip yeah. into the pool. This is like yeah. my swan. This is going to be my swan song, my way to celebrate. Yeah. And I'm running and I take my last final step. <laughs> and sure enough, you know, my feet, my foot just slips right underneath me and I just fall flat on so I, I actually make it into the water because I had picked up so much speed but I make yeah. it in the water I fall flat on my back on the lane line sombrero falls off yeah um I was reminded of that by a, a video from Betsy and, and Chris they had sent it about it literally just dying laughing as they're yeah. because they had never seen it most of the athletes never saw it, it of was course just like yeah. it, in my own mind that that was one of the funniest moments for me yeah that's pretty funny It'd be cool to see. It'd be cool to see that. Imagine, imagine the athletes are in the water, just you know, just celebrating the fact that they just qualified for the Olympics and won Pan American Games, right? But, yeah, uh, maybe I'll post it. People get a good laugh of of me jumping in. Talk about you being open. Let's just see it all, man. Just uh, <laughs> <getting> out there. <laughs> uh, but uh, well, this this has been fun. I appreciate everybody uh, everybody's questions and 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 hanging out with us. And um, you know, we'll keep keep these kinds of things going. But uh. uh Coach and I have some dishes to do, so we're going to uh, go take care of those now. Yeah, I think we milked it as long as we can. I could hear, I could hear your wife yelling back there. Right? Time, yeah. time to go. Yeah, yeah, she's she's about yeah, she's had enough. Yeah, but yeah, I thank you for the opportunity and um, thank everyone for for listening. And I know these are tough times, but uh, play your role, do your part, um, and be ready to ride this thing out. Uh, we'll we'll get we'll get through this and the end of the day i think we'll be better because of it you know the best feelings usually come uh after you think that they can't necessarily come right like that uh that uh you just don't think there's a chance but um we're gonna get through this and we'll be better because of it yeah for sure thanks coach inspirational words all right let's keep it out there guys thanks we'll tune in uh tune in soon and uh uh take care have a good night. Thank you. See ya.